how we got to. Um, yeah, so in terms of what we're going to cover today, I'll do some brief intros uh, and explain why I'm here talking to you today and what Founder Catalyst does. We'll then walk through probably a very high level funding options uh, in the UK. Um, specifically, we'll talk about SEIS and EIS, which are amazing tax relief schemes in the UK. And then we'll look at the anatomy of a fundraise. What does it look like? How do you prepare? What documents? Who signs what? And those kind of things. And then um, as a final insight, I'll share how angels pick their investments. At least I'll tell you how I pick my investments. I've kind of done a mind map based on that. And then, uh, as mentioned, right at the end, we'll do Q&A all in one lump. If you think of any questions as you go along, please enter them into the chat and uh, rather than forget them. So without any further ado, um, so in terms of my background, I, uh, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. So I spent the first 13 years of my career working in a normal IT company. I joined as an engineer, worked up to tech director, moved across to project and program management. And um, in 2013, I was director of project services. I had about 130 employees reporting to me and about 250 million pounds worth of run rate projects. And the business that I'd worked for for 13 years that had grown to nearly half a billion in revenue disappeared overnight. So literally just disappeared. Uh, and the reason for that, it was a private equity backed business that uh, bought 13 businesses over 13 years, bolted them together using private equity cash and bank debt. Um, and unfortunately, the business just kept running out of money, even though it was profitable, it made about 12% EBIT. So every year it made 50 million in profit, but that profit was taken straight out of the business to repay the bank debt. Um, so long story short, that business in uh, 27th of January 2013, that business literally disappeared overnight. So two and a half thousand people made redundant and things like that. So um, I started my own IT company the very next day, um, started that in January 2013 and then exited in September 2017. So over those four years, um, we went from zero to 30 million in revenue. Um, we picked up a couple of really interesting awards. So Sunday Times Tech Tracks, second fastest growing company in the UK, and the Financial Times, 17th fastest growing company in Europe, at which point loads of private equity were sniffing around. They wanted to invest in the business to allow us to buy more businesses and bolt them together. If you were listening to the first part of this chat, I'd been through that journey before with 2E2 and it didn't end so well for me. So I decided to uh, take my money and run in September 2017. So I left my co-founders to undertake that journey and I exited um, in September of that year. And um, and pretty much immediately I started angel investing. So I've been in angel investing for just coming up to six years now. Um, I've made 31 investments, uh, an average of about £25,000. So I, what I want to do is build a diversified and broad portfolio rather than putting all of my eggs in one basket. Um, but I've got three quarters of a million deployed across those 31 companies. And I've got a really strong preference for a tax incentive scheme we'll cover in much more detail in a few slides called SEIS. I love investing I love investing at early stages, you know, first funding round. That's for me the most exciting part of a journey. Um, and I love the tax relief afforded by SEIS as well. Um, when I started angel investing, I kept bumping into loads of uh, loads of founders who had really great ideas. They knew they needed to close uh, a funding round in order to be able to fund their business, but had no idea how to do it. They had no idea, you know, where to find angels. They had no idea what SEIS, EIS or advanced assurance was. And, you know, the thought of the legals around a, a funding round just, you know, terrified them. Um, so I thought uh, I would scratch an itch and do something about that. So I started Founder Catalyst in uh, 2020, 2021. And let's cover briefly what we do within Founder Catalyst, and then we'll cover, uh, we'll move on to the content. So uh, we do four things. The first is we offer a whole bunch of free stuff on our website, things like advisor agreements, employment contracts cap table modeling tools, term sheets, lots of stuff that early stage founders need, but typically can't afford to pay for. The second thing we do is help people get SEIS and EIS advanced assurance. I will tell you much more about that in a bit, but we do that using an amazing platform um, and we do that for free as well. The third thing we do is legal funding round paperwork. So whether you're doing an ASA based round, a normal what's called a price round or an agile round we uh, we've got a SaaS platform that produces all of the documents manages the process collects signatures and just makes it really really quick and easy 
Um, and then finally, we make introductions between our customers and potential sources of funding, which are typically angel groups, junior VCs, SEIS funds, some amazing free platforms and everything else in between. Um, the unique thing about Founder Catalyst, so firstly, you work with myself and my co-founders or all exited founders and angel investors. So we don't just talk the talk, we have walk the walk as well. Um, and secondly, we're commercially unique. So everything we do is a fixed fee of 1500 pounds, no monthly fees, no hidden fees and no percentage of raise as well. So enough of the sales pitch. Let's look at funding options within the UK. So broadly, there are we've categorized these into three kind of groups. You've got debt solutions, equity solutions and a laundry list of stuff in the middle that doesn't fit neatly into either of those um, either of those boxes. Let's cover debt solution first. Lots of founders think, well, I'll just borrow a bit of money. I don't really want to give away equity in my company or sell equity in my company. I'll take on some debt solutions, and that's a nice way to fund my business, which in theory is a great idea, but in practice, lots of the debt solutions just aren't appropriate for early stage businesses. Um, I looked at these when I started my IT company and absolutely none of them were palatable. So I, yeah, I moved on very quickly. Um, and to pick a couple of these and explain why they don't work for really early stage kind of first, second funding round businesses. Let's look, for example, at asset back lending. So this is where, for example, uh, you may own a half a million pound printing press and you want to borrow £50,000 from the bank. And the bank goes, well, OK, we'll lend you £50,000 because we'll take a legal charge over the printing press. And if your business disappears, we'll just come and take the printing press and sell it for 50 grand. So we've covered our, uh, our debt. Well, that's great. But startups, by their very nature, would rarely own an asset worth half a million pounds. So there's no asset really to back any lending against. And again, the next one above, invoice factoring is, a, is another, in theory, great example. And lots of recruitment firms use this, for example. So if you if you, you know, have cash flow issues, then what you can do is when you cut an invoice, which may be on 30 or 60 day terms for your customers, a factoring company give you the money right up front. Uh, so you don't have to wait 30 or 60 days. It really helps with cash flow. The problem with that, early stage startups are typically... Uh, they typically need cash to build a product, to get to MVP, to have, you know, to have initial customers. They may be a year, two years, three years away from paying customers, which means that there won't be any invoices being raised, which means that just isn't an option. You then come to things like, you know, bank debt and bank overdrafts, which, again, in theory, are a great idea. Um, but in almost all cases these days, the banks will require you uh, and your co-founders to give something called a personal guarantee. So if I borrow £100,000 from my bank, um, they would probably gladly give it to me, I would hope. Um, but they will insist that me and my co-founders have a personal guarantee, which means that if the business doesn't work out, if it disappears for whatever reason, then the banks can then come after us individually under the personal guarantee. And ultimately, if you don't repay that debt, uh, you can get sued, you can get made bankrupt, you can lose your home. It's it's a really disappointing outcome. And most people are willing to bet their home on their startup working. So debt solutions, great in theory, in practice, um, there are lots of constraints around how you use them. And there's a bunch of stuff in the middle here that um, are kind of anomalies because they don't fit into any group. But um, you've got grants. Everybody's probably heard of grants. Grants are amazing. You know, effectively, it's free cash. There are a couple of challenges with grants these days. The first is lots of the grants out there are given on the basis that they need to be matched. So if you get a hundred hundred thousand pounds in uh, in an innovate grant, for example, you may have to find another fifty or whatever thousand pounds on top via another funding me uh, mechanism to match that, um, which is fine. You just need to be aware that that is the case. And then secondly, grants, um, I mean, even, even in the last six years since I've exited my business, I've seen that grants are much more contended. So a few years ago, there may be, you know, one in five, one in 10 chance of winning a grant when you apply for it. Now, Innovate are getting many, many more applications, which means a couple of things. Firstly, your chance of winning is relatively smaller. Um, but secondly, the, um, there's there's increasing competition for those grants. So in order to have a good chance of success, actually, you need, really need to polish your material. So typically that will involve paying a grant writing company £5,000 or whatever to help you write your grant application, which when you've got a reduced chance of winning, it doesn't feel like a great investment. Now, that's not to put anybody off applying for grants. They're still, you know, absolutely worth going for, but it's not 
most businesses wouldn't rely on them as a primary means of funding. Um, you then get something called a convertible loan note, or CLN for short. I've included it here because it doesn't really fit. It's kind of straddles debt and equity. So a convertible loan note is where somebody gives you money as a debt type instrument, as a loan, but that can convert under certain conditions into um, into equity at some point in the future. They're really, really, really rarely seen in the UK because um, the convertible loan notes aren't fundamentally compatible with SEI, SEIS. So within the UK, you don't see them often at all. Um, and then you get rewards-based crowdfunding, which I won't dive into much here, but that is something like Kickstarter where you want to develop a product, you need some money to do it. So you forward sell those um, those products uh, to potential customers. And then when you've built the product and you start uh, shipping, you're, the people that have crowdfunded at the start um, gain access there. Um, for lots of you know, SaaS-based startups, for lots of startups, that just um, isn't a viable model either, which leaves us with equity-based solutions. So what I've got here is, that, is a breakdown of the different equity uh, options within the UK. It's worth mentioning up front, virtually no startup will touch every one of these boxes. So nobody will go bootstrap, friends and family, angel, angel networks. They won't linearly go from one end to the other. Um, some some companies, you know, skip the first two boxes and just go to angels. Some people will bootstrap friends and family and then take on VC investors um, or whatever. And so, yeah, it's it's really rare for this to be a linear progression around the um, the diagram. Something interesting happens as you go from bootstrap all the way around for, to uh, to VC. In fact, three interesting things typically happen. The first is that the amount you can raise from these investor types generally increases as you as you move around. So from your friends and family, if you've got, uh, you know, very generous friends and family, you may be able to take 50, 100,000 pounds from those guys. A typical angel round these days is 250,000 pounds for a first round crowdfunding. People raise uh, up to many millions um and strategic investors and vcs can you know can invest millions hundreds and hundreds of millions at a time <clears throat> so it would be normal that the amount you can raise which implies also that your valuation increases as you go around as well so if you're raising from your friends and family then your valuation may be a modest four or five hundred thousand pounds a starting place for an angel investment, um, your valuation is usually, you know, one million to one and a half million somewhere in that raise. And then all the way around to VCs, they invest, you know, if they're putting um, 300 million into your business, then your valuation will be in the billions. Um, the final thing that changes as you move around this journey um, is that there is a, a group of these can make use of SEIS and EIS. Um, so angels, angel groups, crowdfunding and SEIS funds, they will all make use of the tax incentive scheme, SEIS and or EIS. Um, and then when you when you get to strategic investors and VCs, um, that isn't the case. They are institutions investing money and, and therefore they can't make use of SEIS, EIS. Uh, SEIS is meant to incentivize individuals, so angel investors and similar to investors, not meant for incentivizing VCs. What the implication, an implication of that, though, is that as the further you go around this diagram, um, the less founder friendly the terms are. If you take money from your mum and dad, they're probably not going to be fussed about paperwork. They probably don't understand what rights and protections are normal. And therefore, the paperwork is going to be really, if you've got any, is going to be really um, founder friendly. As you move around the diagram, it will get the paperwork will get more investor friendly and therefore less founder friendly. Um, so when you take money from angels, um, they will expect proper paperwork. So you'll have to have a shareholder agreement and articles and other docs will we'll cover later. Um, and they will ask for more rights and protections that, than your uh, mum and dad would. Um, but under SEIS and EIS funding rounds, there are a whole bunch of advanced terms that, ain't, that investors just aren't allowed to use. There are things that you may not have heard of, but probably wouldn't like if you understood them. Things like liquidation preferences and anti-dilution rights that are um, investor protections and they're, they're particularly founder unfriendly. No SEI, SEIS investor can make use of those liquidation preferences and, uh, and anti-dilution rights. So as an angel investor myself, I've got a choice when I invest. I can either have amazing tax breaks of SEIS and EIS, um, or I can have those VC type protections, uh, liquidation preferences and anti-dilution, et cetera. 
inevitably angel investors will pick the tax breaks because they're just amazing. But when you outgrow angels and visa and um, SEIS funds and you move on to institutional investors, the game changes and the, the terms get much less founder friendly. So I've mentioned a lot of times SEIS and EIS and advanced assurance. So let's cover what they are now. <clears throat> Both SEIS and EIS are tax incentive schemes in the UK. And I know we've got some people in foreign countries uh, on the call today. So I'll explain that um, these schemes are only available to uh, UK based uh, taxpayers that are individuals. Um, and, it, and they're meant to incentivize angels for investing in businesses. Now, technically, uh, the easiest way to make use of SEIS and EIS is to be incorporated in the UK. But if you're a foreign business with some um, interest in the UK, either an agent or a director or premises or whatever, um, then you can make use of the SEIS and EIS schemes, even though you may be incorporated in another jurisdiction, which may be of use to some of you. Um, looking at the two schemes, let's cover SEIS first, then we'll come on to EIS. Um, SEIS stands for Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme. Uh, it's the little brother, if you like, of the two schemes. It can only be used um, for the first three years you start uh, trading. So there's a limited uh, time frame to use it. And you can only raise £250,000 under this scheme. So it is, as the name suggests, it is very much meant for uh, seed investment rather than later stage investment. Let's let's do a worked example. So imagine I put £10,000 into your business under SEIS. Then the government gives me back income tax relief almost immediately of £5,000. So I get half of my money back, um, literally like that. Um, if the business does really, really well, so imagine you uh, give me 100 times return on my money after four years. So my £10,000 is all of a sudden worth a million pounds. And I've already had £5,000 back, of course. Um, in any other walk of life, really, when you have an asset that appreciates that much, you would expect to pay capital gains tax on the increase in share value. Under the SEIS and EIS scheme, there's absolutely no capital gains, gains tax to pay on that increase in value. So you can, in theory, turn £10,000 into a million pounds without a penny of tax to be paid. Only the government's giving you half of your money back for your bother as well. There are another two benefits. So um, there's something called loss relief as well. Uh, so if I put £10,000 in, I've already had five back. The government will give me back another £2,200-ish, depending on my prevailing tax conditions, um, as, as a loss relief. So actually, I'm only risking 28% of my investment in your business, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, and imagine I invest in your business, I put £10,000 in, and I die after two years. Then um, the, shares, my, the shares that I own in your company Part would pass to my estate, but outside of the inheritance tax calculation. So they're exempt from inheritance tax, um, which when you get later in life is a really nice way of um, kind of planning for those inheritance tax moments. So that's SEIS. There are, well, there are lots of rules about both of these schemes that I won't go into, um, but in brief, you can only take up to 250,000 pounds and it must be within the first three years you start to trade. Um, what happens if you need you know, lots of first funding rounds or half a million or whatever? How do you achieve that? Well, you can do something called a dual round where the first £250,000 you take is under SEIS and then the next two hundred and fifty is under EIS, for example. So it doesn't mean if you want to raise more than two hundred and fifty, it doesn't mean you skip SEIS. It just means you use that and then EIS on top. Um, so let's cover EIS now. So EIS is the big brother, if you like, of the two schemes. It stands for Enterprise Investment Scheme. Um, and it's much more generous in terms of the amount you can raise and the period you can do that over. You can raise up to 12 million pounds, a maximum of 5 million a year, and you can raise that over seven years from your date of first sale. So much more generous in terms of timescale. Um, unfortunately, not so generous in terms of tax relief for your investors. Um, let's use exactly the same example. I've put 10,000 pounds into your business. Uh, then the government will give me back £3,000 uh, almost immediately. So I get 30% rather than 50% tax back, which is better than nothing, isn't it? Um, if the business does really well and you turn my £10,000 into a million pounds, again, there's no capital gains tax and the inheritance tax exemptions exactly the same as well. 
Um, the loss relief is proportionally less as well. So I'm actually risking, you know, 60-ish percent. Uh, sorry, I'm actually risking 40%. I've got 60% protected. So you get 30% up front and roughly another 30% back from the government. So yeah, I'm risking £4,000 out of the £10,000 that I invest. Um, there's a final type or subtype of EIS known as KIC or knowledge intensive company. And a KIC um, is a business which has uh, a high proportion of PhD or masters, people with those two qualifications, and they're using those qualifications towards the aim of the business. So if you've got a very deep tech research heavy business, then you should be able to make use of KIC with caveats. That allows you to raise up to 20 million in total, up to 10 million a year and over 10 years. So it extends those three limits. So broad brush. And like I say, there are millions of rules about who can invest. So what does a qualifying investor look like? What does a qualifying company look, look like? What trade, what you can and can't do with shares? There are millions of rules that I don't have time to go into today, but um yeah, needless to say, if you can qualify and your investors can qualify, it is a ridiculously good tax scheme. Uh, and probably, you know, it is, is probably the best tax incentive scheme for early stage investors in the world. So I've mentioned the concept a, a couple of times that I have uh, that I haven't touched on yet properly, which is advanced assurance. As an investor, if I want to invest in your business, how do I, how would I have comfort that my investment is going to benefit from the tax relief? Because the, the stock reality is if I've got, um, you know, if, if I've got £10,000 to invest, I've got a business here that offers the tax relief and one that doesn't, all things being equal, I'm going to go with the tax relief. So how do you demonstrate to me as an investor that I will benefit from the tax relief if I invest? There is this magical process called advanced assurance from HMRC. Um, it involves you writing, and we'll cover the process in a moment, you writing to HMRC with a bunch of information, um, and all being well, and as long as your company qualifies and your share structure and everything else qualifies, HMRC will write back with confirmation that any investment in your business um, should benefit under the tax scheme. And that process and the confirmation is called advance assurance. It sounds grand. Actually, it's just an email, but it's a vital email that you can wave at your investors to give them comfort that they will benefit from the tax scheme. So what is it? how do you go about getting advance assurance? <clears throat> Here's a summary of the process. So the first thing you need to have done is, you know, uh, incorporated, which implies you've picked a name. You've probably got a registered office. You've formally incorporated the company's house, or if you're a foreign company, cross-registered uh, to company's house. And, um, and you've got a company bank account as well. That's a prerequisite for taking on the funding usually. You need to prepare some key documents. So to get advanced assurance in process, uh, you need a pitch deck that ticks certain boxes and you need a forecast model again that they need to have specific structures and tick certain boxes for HMRC. Um, you then need to prepare a submission and Founder Catalyst does this on your behalf if you choose that. Um, and the documents you need to go alongside are a shareholders agreement, articles of association. Um, you need details of at least one investor and we'll come back to that in a moment. And you need details of any state age you've had. Um, you bundle all of this together into HMRC, have a, an online form that will take you days and days to build, um, or we can do it on your behalf, but you bundle all of that into a submission, click the submit button, and then you wait between the, the fastest we've ever seen is next business day. But at the moment, because of holidays and everything, it's taking roughly two weeks. Um, and then, yeah, as I say, you'll get hopefully an email from HMRC confirming that your business is eligible um, for uh, under the SEIS and EIS scheme. One thing, it feels like a chicken and egg. So one thing you do need to submit when you do a HMRC advanced assurance application for SEIS is details of at least one investor. And it's a mandatory part of the submission. If you don't submit it, um, then your, uh, yeah, your application will be rejected instantly. So it feels like a chicken and egg because how do I get an investor interested if I don't have advanced assurance um, but how do we get advanced assurance without an investor interest uh, who's interested? It's a really low barrier to entry, though. What you can do is um, you can just list somebody in principle who could potentially invest in your business. So most of you will hopefully know somebody in the UK who isn't a family member, uh, isn't a current employee, 
um, and, and is a UK based taxpayer. And if they tick all, tick all of those boxes, then they are a perfect person to detail in your schedule of investors. You need to provide that person's um, full name, uh, their postal address and the amount they're going to invest. And the amount they, they're going to invest should be a meaningful amount of the overall raise. If you're raising half a million, for example, then saying your next door neighbor is going to put 20 pounds in won't be sufficient. You've got it's got to be 10, 15, 20 percent or something like that. Um, so that is that is how you go about getting advanced assurance. What I wanted to cover now is uh, just a brief introduction into uh, what a funding round looks like from a legal perspective um, and the different types of raise uh, as well. So in, in the UK, there are three different types of uh, raises that are uh, usually seen. If you're if you're you may have heard of, you know, safe notes in America and convertible loan notes and things like that. I'm not going to mention them here or talk any more about them. Neither of those are compatible with uh, SEIS and EIS. So they are very, very, very uh, unusual in the UK. The three primary ways of raising money in the UK. So the first is an ASA or an advanced subscription agreement that allows your business to um, issue something, issue the ASA document to an investor. The investor signs just one piece of paper and then transfers you the cash. Um, they don't get the equity quite yet. So they it's a promise of equity rather than the equity. Um, but to be compatible with SEIS and EIS, that advanced subscription agreement needs to convert into equity within uh, within six months at, uh, at most. Um, the second option is what, what we call a normal or a full priced round or a normal funding round. Um, this is where you have all of your investors lined up. You know, you may have five or ten investors. Everybody signs a whole bunch of documentation and we'll cover on the next slide how that looks. Uh, and then they're issued um, share certificates. So most companies still raise via a full price round, but there are some downsides. It's not very agile and it is like herding cats. You need to make sure all of your investors are lined up at the right time to sign the paperwork. Um, so if your funding round takes three months, you've got to wait until all of your investors are lined up. You don't have any kind of funding over that three months period. So lots of people are using ASAs ahead of a round to raise, um, then a full price round, and then using agile funding to top up, top up after that. Agile funding is really elegant. It's of these three, it's by far my favorite. Um, it allows you to share something called an adherence agreement with, you know, dozens and dozens of investors or potential investors. And when they're good to go, they just sign the adherence agreement and transfer the cash. All of your, um, all of your fundraising under Agile has been pre-approved by existing shareholders in a priced round. So there's no shareholder resolutions. There's no preemption process. There are no consents. There are no legal uh, uh, hoops to jump through other than your new investor signing an adherence agreement. So it's a really elegant solution. As the name suggests, it allows you to, uh, you know, raise money in a much more agile fashion than the kind of big bang full priced funding rounds. What we'll do now is take a look at what a, a full priced round look like. Looks like inevitably, businesses end up doing a full price round, even if you use ASAs up front. There will, uh, at some point, usually within the six months, but sometimes after, you will do a full price round to provide a set of documents that you don't get when you use advanced subscription agreement. <clears throat> so a normal funding process, this is from, you know, you've just incorporated, you need a whole bunch of things in order to get SEIS, EIS advanced assurance, and we've got the details on the left there. Um, you then need a set of documents to pitch. So as an investor, what documents do I want to see? As soon as an, uh, a founder approaches me, I want to see a pitch deck. Oh, that's pretty obvious. I want to see a forecast model covering at least three years. Um, I want to see your term sheet as well. And a term sheet is a distillation of um, the legal terms that will be uh, relevant to your funding round. So it details what company I'm investing in, what the cap table looks like, who the founders are but also what rights and protections you will be offering me. So are you giving me information rights and there, investor consents and things like that? All of those will be detailed in the term sheet. Um, and then as an investor, I will expect to see your proof of advance assurance as well. If you start approaching investors in the UK, 
um, and you don't have any of those full documents, then you're just looking you're just looking uh, ill prepared for a funding round, which isn't isn't a great look. Uh, once you've pitched, hopefully you've got some investors lined up ready to invest, um, and then to onboard the investors, you need free documents. Uh, you need an NDA uh, or a confidentiality agreement to make sure anything you share. And during the due diligence process you're about to go into, you might share details of uh, patents. You might share details that are commercially sensitive or a schedule of employees or whatever. So it's very reasonable at this point for you to ask your potential investors to sign uh, an NDA. Uh, within the UK, um, uh, early stage investment from angels is a regulated activity by the FCA. So you should get your angel investors to sign an FCA consent or disclaimer. And finally, you should ask them to sign the term sheet as well that you've issued in the last section. Assuming your investors are happy to move on, you've then got the mechanisms and the documents associated with the full funding round. This usually happens when you've got your 10 investors or whatever lined up and you do, you, you, your co-founders, any existing shareholders and the investors all uh, sign a whole bunch of documentation. Let's walk through what these documents are individually briefly. Founder service agreement is effectively just an employment contract for you as a founder. There are slight nuances between being a uh, an employee and a director under UK law and the founder service agreement ensures you are engaged in the right way by the company. The next document is an IP assignment. And an IP assignment uh, ensures that all of the IP that the business needs in order to operate, so any patents, trademarks, copyright, code, whatever it happens to be, all of that IP is, is owned by the company rather than the individual directors. Um, you then get something called a disclosure letter, which I won't cover in detail, but is related to a process called warranty and disclosures. Um, and that is signed by each of the founders. You then get new articles of association. So most businesses in the UK adopt what are called model articles or standard articles on company's house. And you will want new articles. Uh, your investors will certainly want new articles as well that give more rights and protections to shareholders and investors. You've then got a couple of documents, which are the mechanics of doing the fund, of authorizing the funding round. So shareholder resolution and board minutes. And then finally, you get the shareholder agreement, which um, is the contractual relationship between the founders, the startup itself as a legal entity, any shareholders and the investors. The two big documents here are the shareholders agreement and articles. Both are you know, 40 or 50 pages each. Um, finally, once you finish the funding round, the paperwork fund doesn't stop there. You've got a bunch of documents that so you need to issue each of your uh, investors a uh, share certificate when you receive the cash. You need to file something called an SHO1 uh, or an allotment of shares uh, to notify companies house that the shares have been allotted. And you need to go through an SCIS1 to SCIS3 process with HMRC to ensure that your investors can benefit from the tax relief. You'll be really glad to hear that virtually every document on this, uh, every legal document on this page is produced by Founder Catalyst. We've got a system which produces literally every single document and ensures that it's signed by the right person at the right time in the, in the right order. <clears throat> so that is the anatomy of a funding round. There's just one thing that else that I wanted to cover before diving into hopefully some interesting question and answers. And this is... Um, my kind of brain dump on how I assess a startup. So one thing founders often ask me is, how do you decide what to invest in or not? And I, you can imagine, given my um, my role in Founder Catalyst, I see literally thousands of pitch decks a year. Um, and I, I still invest, I still invest four or five times a year. How do I decide out of those thousands which to, um, yeah, which to invest in? I won't go around each of these items because that would take all day. Um, but hopefully you can read at your leisure. I think to pull out a couple of um, things that are really important to me as an angel, and it's worth mentioning, every angel in their head probably has a slightly different version of this. They will probably have, you know, the same eight high level themes, but they may give different weight to different items here. And they may, yeah, they may have different preferences um, based upon their experience or whatever. But for me, the first place I go is team. I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for an amazing team with, you know, the main thing is attitude and passion. You can replace a lot of things in a startup, but if you've got a founding team that lack attitude and passion, then, you know, it's not great. Um, and there is, you know, there is a saying that you can, if you've got a great founding team, 
and an average product, then they will find a way to make it work. There will be pivots, they will do something slightly different. And that amazing team will turn that you know ad- average idea into a great idea. If you've got a great idea and a very average team, though, then the opposite is likely to happen. The execution will be poor and the outcome won't be so great for an investor. Um, so that's really the first place I go is team. And then I look at, you know, what's the, am I going to get at least 10 times of my money out of this? If I can't, then is it really worth doing? Um, and you may think, well, hang on, 10 times is a bit greedy. But if I've got a portfolio of, say, 10 companies, uh, then of those companies, eventually, you know, five or six of those companies are just going to flat out fail. They will not succeed. Um, a couple of those companies will bimble along and maybe get a two or three times return. So my blended return at that point is virtually nothing other than tax relief. And then you need one or two businesses at the top end to give a really decent sized return so that your balanced portfolio ends up at being three or four times uh, the return. So if you're not offering, you know, something like a 10 times return, then my portfolio isn't going to deliver the three times return I need. Um, and then you get things that, you know, the proposition is a really interesting one. Is it highly scalable? Um, everybody will have noticed, you know, if you're raising for an AI startup these days, then, um, you know, that really is on trend and the valuations and, and everything are much more, much more interesting than they were just two years ago. So that's a brief uh, look inside an angel's head. Um, no, that is no, that is not the case. So EIS can have existing shareholders. You can have you could have done a funding round with foreign investors. You can have yeah. So yeah, there's no such. Um, there are there are some weird and wonderful rules. So if I've invested in your business and uh, without EIS, I then can't invest under EIS myself, for example. But that doesn't mean you can't take other EIS investments. So. No, no, there's no no such rule. You you're not allowed to be a subsidiary, for example. So if you're if you're owned by your your other company, that doesn't work. But no, that's that doesn't sound right at all, Carl. So I'd be delighted to have a chat with your COO if you uh, I'll provide my contact details and yeah, let's talk. But that sounds that sounds wrong. So um, what you've just described, Carl, your company has a great team by the sound of it. So um, that's a really great great place to start. I mean, yeah, and this covers a lot of things. I've already mentioned attitude and passion. You know, there are qualifications. There are, have you been there and done it before? That is really, um, yeah, that is a really prized possession for investors. Um, there's, there's something about the number of founders as well. So having... Uh, you yeah, know, having a sole founder, lots of investors won't touch just a sole founder. Whereas, you know, I've seen a company with seven or eight founders and, yeah, I ran away from that one as well because the chance for disharmony and the whole thing just falling apart is high. You've also got the broader team. It's not just about the CEO and the people around them. It's about uh, the advisors and NEDs and things like that. I mean, yeah, I have seen, I've seen some at very average teams, let's call it that. And I've seen some amazing teams. So to give you an example, one of the companies I invested in, I went to a Google pitch event and the guy has a PhD in AI, is a part-time lecturer at UCL and is a hedge fund trader. He's built a commodities forecasting platform using AI in his spare time. And he's got a team of around him. He's got a COO, he's got somebody with massive in, uh, insurance. And there was somebody who's already exited a business as part of his management team. That is a pretty solid team. Yeah, the, I mean, it's not uncommon to see sole founders. Um, there are some investors that just won't invest in uh, so, solo founders. Um, usually when they've been bitten by it before, they, you know, uh, for whatever reason. I I think the game, you know, it, and it, it, the reality is there is, only, there is only one founder, but what you can do is bolster the team, you know. So I, I want to understand... Not not just the founders, but what are the team around you? What advisors, what employees have you got? What NEDs, what support have you got? Because it's really hard for you as a sole, solo founder to, to be across everything. You know, people either have a passion in technology or product or operations or sales. Having a single person that can cover all of that is really difficult. So part of the trick is bringing to life how 
how you and your team it doesn't you know it's not about you you've got to make it as broad as possible whether it's ned's advisors or employees uh how are you going to get across all of those parts of business the business and scale um and that's more of a story you know that's a journey that you've got to paint a picture of rather than just just waving a cv i'm afraid Every founder who's been at the coal face, you know, you know that you are, you know, one day you're doing invoicing, the next day you're talking to customers, the next day you're pitching. It's, you know, founders where at least until they get, yeah, at least a few years in, usually founders wear so many hats and you've got to be, you know, massively versatile, I think. It's relatively cost effective to get to get to the point of closing your first funding round. Uh, you know, you need some basics. You need to have incorporated. You need a bank account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, not, that doesn't cost a lot at all. You may need support doing, you know, pitch deck forecasts and those kind of things. Um, the two the two areas where uh, the expense kicks in so funding round legals and SEIS, EIS, advanced assurance you know i remember every company that i've started in the past i end up throwing 10 or 15 thousand pounds a lawyer and that really 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 annoyed me uh, hence why i created founder catalyst so i don't have to throw 10 000 and 15 thousand pounds and so startups don't have to as well um and then there is a cost to capital so depending on how you're finding your investors if you manage to you know find them by hustling or on LinkedIn or pitch events or whatever, then it may be free. But quite often, if you're going to angel groups or private equity clubs or using a broker, then there will be a fee to pay there as well. But quite often that fee is out of the money you raise. So you raise £250,000 and you need to pay somebody 5% of that once you've got the cash, which is obviously much easier because you've got the cash in the bank already and that's not a problem. So the the upfront, you know, the barriers to entry commercially to doing a funding round are, are really, really small, actually. There's a, uh, you know, there's a spectrum of, uh, of options here. So perfect is you've got the team in place. They're already in the company. They've already bedded down. You know, people can work together. They may have worked together before. You know, that is that is ideal. What is what is the, the opposite of ideal uh, is, you know, you've got a sole founder who just doesn't know. They haven't found anybody. They haven't got a plan. They haven't they haven't even got a roadmap for what the future looks like. Um, so the more you can get away from the latter towards the former, the better. So if you can say, well, we've got the first two hires identified, but we need cash in the bank from an investment in order to press go, um, then you know that's pretty strong. As an investor, I would be I would be comfortable with that. Uh, yeah, if you don't, if you just don't know what roles, and therefore you don't know who's going to sit in there, I would that would raise concerns with me as an investor. And by the way, I'm not. I you know the first thing I look at is team. But, but I do invest in sole, sole founders. I don't mind investing in sole founders, but they've got to have a plan because scaling right. any, any decent business is not going to be done by one person. So uh, mine was more passion than value. So I'm not particularly, you know, there are investors mm -hmm. who just invest in impactful or sustainable businesses or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that, I, I, you know, I, I invest in lots of things. But for me, it's, the reason I started investing was, uh, you know, I, I'm i just passionate about supporting founders. I love supporting founders in their mm -hmm. early stage. Uh, it's a, I love building and disrupting things, and I love supporting other people to do okay. that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, mine is not just, you do get people who invest literally just for the monetary returns, you know, hopefully a three times return on their capital deployed. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are all there are lots of other kind of drivers why why people invest. And mine actually isn't yet. Yeah, it's not green or sustainable or anything like that. It's more supporting, yeah, supporting entrepreneurs to have the same opportunities that that I've had. Mm. Which, which again is why I created Founder Catalyst because you know what better way yeah. to support hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of founders a year is to create a company that that supports them uh, along the way. Mm. 
So um, one of my favorite, yeah, what my it is my favorite investment. So there's a company called Skin Analytics who do uh, melanoma detection using a smartphone. So you take a picture of a mole and it will tell mm-hmm. you whether that mole, um, yeah, that mole is uh, a melanoma or not. Um, yeah, I I love the team. It comes back to team team again. The CEO is amazing, mm-hmm. and yeah. Yeah, it has been a it has been quite the journey he's been on over the last 10 years, but he is, you know, as passionate today as he was on day one. The yeah, his CTO, he's got a PhD in AI and is just a, a, amazing. They're really great people. I love their mission. Um mm-hmm. you know, they they've already yeah. built a product that is uh it is better at detecting melanoma than the best dermatologist, for example. Um and yeah, it's a regulated industry, so the barriers to entry are quite high. So you know, so I expect them to have a good outcome. Um, it's one I particularly care about because I lost a friend to melanoma a few years ago. Um, after I'd actually invested in, in them anyway, so it's close to my heart. But I, I just love everything about the business. I love it. it's a really good use of tech. It's you know, it was a use of AI before AI was trendy. You know, my investment was made six years mm-hmm. ago now, um, and the founding team's just amazing. Um, one four nine five X VAT, um, and there's that's everything that we've discussed today. So SEI, SEIS, advanced assurance, introductions, and all of your legal funding round paper. And there's we're unique in the UK. There's no monthly fees, no hidden fees. We don't take a percentage. It's of one off fee, one off fee, one thousand per funding round. Yeah, per funding round. Oh, that's interesting.